So as far as the choice of anti-HFR therapy or the choice of an anti-androgenic therapy in a patient with first-line metastatic colorectal cancer, this comes back to the question, uh, <clears throat> what is the goal of treatment? I'm going to take you through two scenarios. If my goal of therapy here is downstaging in a patient who has no resectable disease at this point but has potentially resectable disease, then my goal is to get um, the highest response possible. And I think at this point it's fair to say that there are two modalities of treatment to get the highest response possible. We know from the TRIBE clinical trial, which has looked at fulfoxiri and Avastin and compared that to fulfiri and Avastin, that there is a high response rate. Now true on that particular trial, there was no statistically significant improvement in resectability, but there is a higher or trend towards, towards better downstaging, which may translate in better resectability. And indeed, in this meeting, there will be an update on the TRIBE clinical trial. And what we have learned is that the five-year overall survival in patients who start with very intensive chemotherapy with fulfoxiri and Avastin, the five-year overall survival is 25%. The five-year overall survival with fulfiri and Avastin, which is a doublet chemotherapy that is also considered a standard of care, was about half of that, 12%. So in a patient who is fit, very good performance status, a younger individual, I think one option, irrespective of the RAS status, is fulfoxiri and Avastin. What is the problem with this regimen? There's a higher bone marrow suppression. There is a higher risk of diarrhea. There is a higher risk of severe fatigue. So someone has to be really fit and bearing to be able to get this regimen. On another note, if I know that somebody has a RAS wild type tumor, there is no BRAF mutation, and there is no KRAS, no NRAS mutation. Those patients appear to have a better response rate with the addition of an anti-EGFR agent. And I think now the data is pretty conclusive. Initially, when we looked at the FIRE 3 data and when it was reported and published, the publication was based on an investigator assessment. And in that initial analysis, the response rate was similar between the arm that received fulfiri cetuximab and fulfiri bevacizumab. However, we have learned from updates at ESMO with an independent committee review, with radiology review, that there is a much higher response rate on the fulfiri cetuximab arm by about 10%. Now, response matters to get a patient into a resection. We have also learned from CLGB80405 that there is more than 10% response rate for the cetuximab arm versus the bevacizumab arm in RAS wild type patients. So that is important because if you look at the data that was presented by Dr. Vinok regarding the resection rates, in patients on 80405, and these are patients who presented with unresectable disease or without a plan to put the patient through hepatic resection and were enrolled on that study. About 10% of those patients underwent resection, but there was a, a significantly higher number of patients that underwent resection on the cetuximab arm than the bevacizumab arm. To me, that suggests that the downstaging that is increased in the setting of an anti-HFR therapy compared to bevacizumab may be important to lead the patient to a curative resection or a curative intent resection. Now, we know that patients who undergo resection often relapse. We know that about 70% or more of patients, if we look at clinical trial, will have eventually re relapse after hepatic resection. But is it still important to get a patient to a hepatic resection? And the answer is absolutely yes. And why is that? because even in those patients who relapse, we tend to see a better overall survival. People who undergo resection without any residual disease have about a 50% five-year overall survival, and that is approximately two years more than patients have with chemotherapy alone. So back to your, what we were talking about, um, when do I use an anti-HFR therapy versus a bevacizumab? I think clearly I would consider it in a patient with RAS wild type tumor with liver only disease, for example, where I would be able at one point to do liver directed therapies, hepatic resection, the mix of hepatic resection or, or RFA if the patient has a good response. I think the data is not very clear, however, in the setting of a patient who has multi-organ involvement, who is not potentially resectable, uh, irrespective of what your response could be.
What kind of patient is that? It would be a patient with pulmonary metastases and hepatic metastases and retroperitoneal lymph node metastases where you don't have data that those patients should undergo resection at any point. Now, should those patients undergo fulfoxiri, Avastin, even if they're RAS wild type, should they go with fulfiri, encetuximab, or fulfiri, penitumumab, or fulfox, penitumumab, or fulfox, cetuximab? The data is not very clear. Um, what we know at least is that 80405 tells us that in patients who do not undergo resection or in the general population that went uh, on 80405, it appears that the overall survival is similar. Uh, but for patients who are potentially resectable, I think it's very important that we downstage them to the max. And in those patients, either we have to go with very aggressive triplet chemotherapy or we have to strongly consider anti-HFR treatment. So <clears throat> when we decide about an anti-HFR treatment for patients with metastatic colorectal cancer, we have to look at the indications, FDA indications, and we also have to look at the clinical data. There have been several first-line clinical trials that have been conducted in patients with metastatic colorectal cancer that looked at chemotherapy versus chemotherapy plus anti-HFR therapy. The CRYSTAL trial looked at fulfiri plus cetuximab and compared that to fulfiri. Now, on the CRYSTAL trial, we see an improvement in overall survival of about eight months with fulfiri plus cetuximab versus fulfiri in patients who have all RAS wild-type tumors, not KRAS wild type only, all RAS wild type tumors. That contrasts to only about four months difference in overall survival when the original data was published in the KRAS wild type population. If we look at the prime clinical trial, which is full FOX versus full FOX plus penitumumab, and we also look at the cohort of patients who have RAS wild type tumors and BRAF wild type tumors, we also see about a seven months difference in overall survival. So it appears that the difference in overall survival, but with different backbones of chemo, are not too far apart in the first-line treatment. There appears no good reason to think at this point that there is a major difference between these two agents. If we look at a randomized clinical trial of cetuximab versus penitumumab in patients who have progressed or were intolerant to systemic chemotherapy that was conducted in Europe in patients with KRAS wild-type tumors, there was no difference in overall survival between these two agents. The overall survival was approximately 10 months for both. This was a non-inferiority study, and it basically showed that penitumumab is no inferior to cetuximab. Both agents are monoclonal antibodies. Both target the same target and have very similar outcomes when we look at first line as well as refractory patients. So in my opinion, even though we do not have head-to-head -head studies in the first-line setting between cetuximab and penitumumab, or head-to-head -head studies in the second-line setting, I think it's fair to say that these two agents are interchangeable. Now, would I decide to use penitumumab with full theory or with full fox? I personally do not see a good reason to differentiate between both agents as far as selection with a backbone of chemotherapy. I tend to use penitumumab in certain patients because I want to use it on an every other week basis, so it becomes patient convenience. And I think the other thing to consider is that, especially if you are in a geographic area where there is a higher incidence of hypersensitivity, it is important to consider that penitumumab has a significantly less hypersensitivity reaction than cetuximab. So these are the points to consider. There are certain areas, however, where there is no difference in hypersensitivity between cetuximab or there is a very low hypersensitivity to cetuximab. It is also important to note that there appears to be no significant difference in skin rashes between these two agents when the head-to-head -head study has been performed. The only differences we see in toxicity are a higher rate of hypomagnesemia with penitumumab by a few percentage point for grade three hypomagnesemia, and certainly a significantly higher hypersensitivity reaction to cetuximab. So hypersensitivity is more serious, especially if it's grade three. Uh, if you are in an area where the incidence appears to be three or 4% or higher for grade three hypersensitivity, I think the safe thing to do is more to consider penitumumab in that situation.
So as we use anti-HFR therapy more now in the first-line setting, it's important to realize and be cognizant of the fact that skin toxicity is common. And indeed, almost every single patient will have some skin toxicity. In the majority of the cases, it is a manageable skin toxicity, but this can also include severe acne form reaction. Now, we have known from the STEP clinical trial and from other clinical trials that have looked at, at systemic antibiotics for prevention of skin rash that systemic antibiotics, either with minocycline or with doxycycline, are effective in reducing skin rash. The STEP clinical trial, which has been reported a few years ago, has looked at a strategy of using sunscreen, hydrocortisone cream, as well as doxycycline, and to look at the incidence of grade two rash with this preemptive strategy versus a reactive strategy. So half the patients had a preemptive strategy of hydrocortisone cream, antibiotic, and sunscreen, and half of the patients only received a treatment strategy when they developed the rash. That study was very clear. There is a much less incidence of grade two and above skin toxicity in the arm that received the preemptive management. Now, there has been a recent study that has been performed in Asia as well that looked at the similar strategy using minocycline and a similar strategy as well as the STEP clinical trial that we talked about earlier, and it basically confirms the same findings. If you use a preemptive strategy, you have less toxicity. So every single patient that I have will receive doxycycline starting day one of treatment. You will receive 100 milligram POBID on day one of anti-HFR therapy. Now we know that the skin rash typically peaks around four weeks from treatment. And it continues all through, but it tends to start improving around two months. So at least in the, the beginning of the therapy and in the first few months of treatment, these patients should be strongly considered for an antibiotic, uh, such as doxycycline or minocycline. In a setting where a patient has no rash at all, you may consider to back off the antibiotic. In a patient, for example, who has a lingering grade two rash despite antibiotic use, I will never back off the antibiotic because typically what we see with those patients, if you stop the antibiotic, the rash flares even worse. So um, the other thing that we have done and I think is very important to do is to align yourself with a dermatologist, whether you're in a community practice or whether you are in an academic center. If you're in a community practice, you could certainly meet one-on-one -on -one with a dermatologist and go over you know, your treatment paradigm, discuss the fact that you're using anti-HFR therapy. And yes, true, some of the community dermatologists do not see those patients, but they do have um, special recommendations and follow-up in treatment, and they can be really an effective part of your team, especially if they see these patients over and over again. So our dermatologists will use a concussion of creams, and we are now using even a higher potency steroid than hydrocortisone 1% in some patients. And we see very good results. So I, I find that very helpful. Uh, it's also very helpful in, in, in investigating any possibility of skin infections in those patients and treating it early on with antibiotics. 